my lawyers. All right, we are now, uh, this is uh, Josephus, part two, and we're calling this historian and Bible commentator. Let's, we've cut out the traitor part. <laughs> um, and this is the first of an eight-week lecture series where we will be focusing on the Jewish war, uh, Josephus' account of the Jewish war. And um, I want to, in the last couple of classes, get to look at the way he looks at the Hebrew Bible stories. So, uh, today is um, February the 4th? It's, uh, okay. Uh, Tu B'Shvat. Tu B'Shvat, yes. Happy Tu B'Shvat. Oh, it's my grandson's birthday. Mazel so. <laughs> <laughs> Tov. Okay. So, um, just, to, uh, just to sum up where we are. Uh, we started uh, last class looking at the, um, we, we began looking at the causes of the war and the and the uh, outbreak of the war, which started to happen in the spring of 66. And it resulted from a series of uh, riots that begin in Caesarea and spread to Jerusalem, and the incredibly inept and ridiculous response of the Roman pure procurator Florus, who throws gasoline on the fire instead of trying to calm it down. And despite the best efforts of those in the Jewish establishment, like King Herod Agrippa II, um, and others, like the high priest Ananus, Ananias and others, um, the, um, the population is too angry and they uh, kick out the uh, Roman garrison of Jerusalem. Um, this causes the legate of the province of Syria, Cestius Gallus, to come from Antioch with an army of uh, 30,000 um, uh, men. And um, he attacks, uh, he subdues the Galilee, which doesn't take very long because most of the place in the Galilee are really not interested in revolting. He comes into Jerusalem. He uh, gets into the city um, after some, and a certain amount of fighting going on. He retreats from the city for reasons which were not 100% clear. And in the process of his retreat from Jerusalem to back towards Caesarea, which is the Roman headquarters for the area. Um, he is attacked by the rebels. Um, uh, he, even though he has regular legionnaires, they are at a disadvantage in the narrow passes that he goes through. And through a series of engagements, um, he, essentially, um, the, 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 his force is, uh, uh, I'm not going to use the word decimated, because technically speaking, that means one out of 10 was killed. He <laughs> suffers horrendous casualties. Uh, one of his legions loses its eagle, and he's forced back to Caesarea in ignominious retreat after the battle of what's called the Battle of Beth Haron, which is one of the places where he had established a camp to try and salvage the situation. So at the uh, so here the the winter of sixty six, uh, the Romans have retreated in disarray. Uh, Cestius uh, Gallus is in disgrace. Um, the mo what you have has been described as the creation of a provisional government, which brings together um, various factions in the city who are governing the revolution, the rebellion. The anti-rebellion people like Herod Agrippa and his uh, <coughs> wife uh, slash sister Bernice um, have fled the city. Um, there's been a certain amount of political um, retribution against those who supported the Roman government. Um, but the, the moderates are trying to hold things together. And in the winter of 66, 67, what they do is they, um, this is when Josephus is appointed commander of the Galilee. He is sent to the Galilee to organize defenses because they know um, that uh, the <coughs> Romans will be back. Um, Josephus is sent there. there he has some um, political problems with some other commanders, which is described in the wars um, fairly succinctly. But if we go back to his autobiography, he, most of the autobiography is spent on that political um, back and forth over his uh, being a commander in the galley. There were those who uh, were against it. There were those who distrusted him. 
Um, uh, he was quite young to be put in that position. Um, and in his uh, autobiography, which of course is done towards the end of his life, he is trying to reply to his critics and to give a lot more detail about what happened. We're not going to concern ourselves with that. What, what is, he goes there and he starts a series of um, strengthening the garrisons. Um, uh, there are cities in the Galilee that are not interested in the rebellion and refuse to participate. Um, so it's not completely a unified effort. Um, in addition, Jerusalem is being forti further fortified by the provisional government. So that's what's happening on the one side. On the Roman side, um, the Emperor Nero is, you know, naturally absolutely furious. Again, Judea is an extremely uh, strategic locale, and it's really important that the Romans hold it. Um, they can't let it go. And now this has gone beyond the bounds. I mean, it, it already did when Cestius Gallus came in. It's gone beyond the bounds of negotiation. Now, now the, the, prov the area is in full-fledged rebellion, and it requires a full-fledged military campaign. And of course, this happened uh, throughout the history of the Roman Empire. There were provinces that went into rebellion, um, and uh, not unusual. It happened in Britain. It, you know, it, it happened in various places. And uh, the Romans, when they come in, good morning, uh, the Romans, when they come in, they come in um, with deadly force. They, they, they don't fool around, um, and uh, everybody knows uh, what's going to happen. I mean, when you read, you know, the speech, when we, we looked at the speech of Herod Agrippa uh, II, it was, uh, you know, he warned them about what would happen should the Romans come in, and um, now it's going to happen. The question is, who is going to commander? Who's going to be the commander? This is critical. And um, when is it going to happen? So, yes, uh, Suzanne. One thing I remember reading is that the Romans who were sent out to govern were expected to make their fortune from the country they were governing. Yes, they were expected, exactly. So they levied taxes, they did, you know, things that eventually did result in rebellion in a number of ways. Well, again, it, it, some of them ruled quite fairly, and you're right. They got their salaries and their fortunes from, uh, from being uh, sent out there. And we discussed earlier the tax farming system whereby the, how the emperor got his money um, was through the local governors who then uh, subcontracted out. And I think the procurators of the smaller areas were then a further level of it. It was uh, subcontracted to private uh, tax collectors who uh, would be allowed to collect a certain percentage above what the various levels wanted. And of course, sometimes they just tried to get as much as they could. Uh, and you're right, there was a great deal of corruption, and it, it could be an incredibly corrupt system. Uh, and it, apparently in Judea, it tended to be that way because of the quality of the pure corridors was very low, generally speaking. So, here we are in uh, 60, uh, uh, winter of 66-67, and Nero decides to appoint uh, Vespasian as the uh, general to put down the rebellion. So what I want to do is, first of all, look at the material I've given you. The first page is um, quotes from Suetonius, the lives of the 12 Caesars. Now, Suetonius lives a little after Josephus. In fact, he may have actually used Josephus as a source. Um, the other source for Vespasian's career is in Tacitus. Um, the, there's two works of Tacitus uh, that we have. Um, one is the Annals, um, which unfortunately breaks off um, around, at, with, the, uh, with the death of Nero and um, doesn't tell us a lot about uh, Vespasian. Um, there's a, another work that does sort of more or less picks up where the Annals uh, breaks off and uh, talks about the Vespasian's campaign um, in Judea and his rise to becoming Caesar, which we will deal with the, uh, pr probably next week, um, what happened, um, you know, the, the civil war in Rome, which causes another hiatus. Because I want to emphasize again, the war goes in different stages. The first stage has concluded. There's a hiatus over the winter of 66-67. The war picks, uh, really starts up again in the spring, which is not unusual. Uh, they did not tend to fight in the winter in, um, uh, in ancient times. 
Um, and then there's going to be, after a couple of years, there's going to be another hiatus um, when civil with Nero's assassinate uh, Nero's death, not assassination, he kills himself. But there's a civil war breaks out in Rome uh, over the, the the misrule of Nero. Um, there comes what's called the year of the three Caesars, where three uh, generals in succession become emperor and are subsequently overthrown. And it will it, so that causes another hiatus of uh, you know almost a, a whole year in the war because Vespasian, as commander of the forces in the east, um, becomes a major player and very cannily um, waits to see what is going on and ultimately rises to become emperor himself with the support of the legions from the east and also from the Danube. Um, so that will cause another break in the war. And then when Vespasian becomes emperor and goes to Rome, his son Titus takes over the campaign, um, which really at this point is the siege of Jerusalem, except for some other territory, minor uh, areas. Um, what will happen is then, um, so that's the third part of the war, uh, which will end with the fall of Jerusalem. And then the final part of the war is the reduction of the surviving uh, fortresses that are holdouts, which include Masada. So we are now in the, this, this period of the, of the first hiatus of the war. And so let's learn a little bit about Vespasian. I mean, Suetonius has a whole chapter about Vespasian, including his family um, and his early years and his upbringing. Um, he comes from a family known as the Flavians, which were a minor no uh, family of nobility. He rose as uh, any uh, rose up through the ranks um, in Roman society through a variety of public and military offices, political and military offices, um, including. Um, and he had close connections um, with the uh, Emperor Claudius and uh, Nero. Um, and this is one of the ways he got ahead. But as you will see, um, by the time of the rebellion, he is already um, what we would call, in Roman terms, a senior citizen, so to speak. In other words, he's not young anymore. He is a veteran commander and uh, with a lot of political experience as well. Um, so let's um, read the selections that I gave you, which gives you a sense of a little bit of his earlier career and as to why he was uh, chosen. So uh, Suzanne, you want to start in the reign of Claudius? In the reign of Claudius, 43 CE, he was sent in command of a legion to Germany through the influence of Narcissus. From there, he was transferred to Britain, where he fought 30 battles with the enemy. He reduced to subjection two powerful nations, more than 20 towns, and the island of Vectus near Britain, partly under the leadership of Aulus Claudius, the consular governor, and partly under that of Claudius himself. Stop here for a second. The Roman conquest of England, of Britain, really was done under Claudius. In other words, Julius Caesar had sent a couple of expeditions to Britain, but essentially Britain was not incorporated into the Roman Empire until Claudius. It was that when Claudius um, sent a, uh, and which sometimes he actually participated in, a series of military campaigns that reduced uh, Britain uh, all the way up to, uh, to what we would call the border with Scotland today, and then the Romans went further all the way up to, to the north, the so southern half of Scotland, but that was much later. Um, but it is Claudius that conquers uh, a Britain, uh, which is why he's given the title Britannicus, and which why he, his son's, Claudius' son's name is Britannicus. So Vespasian was one of the legion, uh, uh, commanders of the legions, involved in the conquest of Britain, and obviously Suetonius says that he, um, you know, was a very successful military commander. But he's worked his way up the ranks already. In other words, this is not his f uh, first military appointments. Go on. For this he received. For this he received the triumphal regalia, and shortly after, two priesthoods besides the consulship which he held for the last two months of the year. So here are political offices that he gets um, that are, again, part, if you're going to rise in Roman political life, this is how you do it. Go on. The rest of the time up to his proconsulate, he spent in rest and retirement through fear of Agrippina. That was, Cla that was Claudius's wife. Who still had a strong influence over her son, Nero, and hated any friend of Narcissus, even after the latter's death. 
Okay, so he very politically decides to retire, mm -hmm. to get out of political life when things really begin to heat up so as to avoid being um, caught up in a situation where he would be put to death. But notice, um, it was in 43, and he was born in 9, which um, makes him 36, uh, no, 30, um, uh, 33, uh, 34 at the time he was sent to, uh, to Germany and then to Britain. All right, read on. <clears throat> there had spread over all the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated at that time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. Mm. This prediction, referring to the emperor of Rome, as afterwards appeared from the event, the people of Judea took to themselves. Accordingly, they revolted, 66 CE, and after killing their governor... Which we assume Florus. is Florus, and of course this is the only place where it's mentioned that Florus was killed. killed. We, uh, Josephus does not mention Florus being killed, and Josephus is closer to the events than Suetonius, okay? okay? They routed the consular ruler, Cestius Gallus, of Syria as well, when he came to the rescue, and took one of his eagles. That's where we get the idea that the eagle was lost. Go on. Since to put down this rebellion required a considerable army with a leader of no little enterprise, yet one to whom so great power could be entrusted without risk, Vespasian was chosen for the task by Nero both as a man of tried energy and as one in no wise to be feared because of the obscurity oh. <laughs> of his family and name. Okay, in other words, he came from minor nobility, uh -huh. so the assumption was that Nero could trust him to do it because he wasn't a threat yeah. to mm -hmm. the emperor. Um, but notice, in 66, therefore, how old is Vespasian? Um, if he's born in 9, he's um, 30, he's... he's Right. 50, 50, 57. He's 57 already. That, that's, in Roman terms, that's getting up there. Okay? And in fact, you know, uh, when he becomes emperor, he doesn't rule that long. He dies in 79. So, I mean, you know, go on. Um, therefore. Therefore, there were added to the forces in Judea two legions with eight divisions of cavalry and ten cohorts. He took his elder son, Titus, as one of his lieutenants. And as soon as he reached his province, he attracted the attention of the neighboring provinces also. Okay, so Titus is already uh, an adult and himself has had military experience. And we'll look at Titus in a little more detail uh, when, we, when we get to the part where he takes over command. All right, so his, his, sons are, his second son is Domitian. Okay, for he at once reformed the discipline of the army and fought one or two battles with such daring that in the storming of a fortress he was wounded in the knee with a stone and received several arrows in his shield. Josephus actually describes this, and this is where um, I think Suetonius may be relying on Josephus for some of his writing. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, he Suetonius could have also had access to the same um, Roman military sources that Josephus himself relied on. But it's quite possible he was uh, reading Josephus. Go on. When he consulted the oracle of the god of Carmel in Judea... That's really interesting. Is that the Jewish... Uh, is this a right. Jewish oracle or not? I don't know, you know? The lots were highly encouraging, promising that whatever he planned or wished, however great it might be, would come to pass. And one of his high-born prisoners, Josephus, by This name, is why I think he's reading Josephus, by the way. As he was being put in chains, declared most confidently that he would soon be released by the same man, who would then, however, be emperor. Okay, so uh, Suetonius repeats the story that we Josephus... That in... Exactly, we had read that, we read that passage before. This is the only mention of Josephus outside his own works, by the way, um, uh, is in Suetonius. Uh, who could have got it from Josephus. So uh, the, the point is, you see why Vespasian was appointed. He, was, uh, he had really good political connections. He was an established, he was well respected by the legions. And what he does is um, he assembles, as you will see, he assembles a huge army to take care of the rebellion. So if you look at the next page, you will see the campaign of Vespasian in the spring of 67. He, uh, he spends the winter gathering his forces. 
So if you take a look down at the chronology, he's appointed in late 66 by Nero. Um, and over the winter, Vespasian goes to Syria and sends his son Titus to Egypt. Um, uh, Vespasian goes to Antioch, which is the capital of the province of Syria, where the legions would be, um, uh, the eastern legions would be, uh, 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 you know, garrisoned. garrisoned thank you. Um, and um, he sends Titus to pick up one of the legions uh, that are in Alexandria, because there are two legions stationed in Egypt. Um, and so he goes to get the 15th legion in, um, in Alexandria. During that winter, as you see, Josephus is involved in fortifying the Galilee. So in the spring of 67, he arrives in Antioch, he gathers together his forces, and he's joined by King Agrippa and King Agrippa's troops, which could be, some of them could be Jewish, by the way, all right? Um, they go to Ptolemaeus, which is Acre today. That was, uh, uh, Haifa, of course, didn't exist. Acre is, the, is a port, a very ancient city, um, and was an important port city. So they came from Antioch down to uh, Ptolemaeus. And there, um, what's interesting is, is that Sipporah, which is the largest city, and one of the largest cities in the Galilee, they don't want to get involved. And they send, you know, everybody knows he's coming. I mean, it's not like a secret. And so they send uh, ambassadors to uh, him to, in effect, say, uh, we don't want to be involved. Help us. And um, Vespasian immediately sends troops, um, uh, 6,000 infantry, 1,000 cavalry under one of his officers um, to, um, to fortify Sapporo. So that's already a major defeat by uh, uh, of the the rebellion that Sepporis is now a center of uh, Roman uh, of Roman troops in the area. Okay, so um, causing serious trouble to Josephus. Yes, another reference. Yeah, it, no, that's um, uh, uh, that that's from Josephus himself. In other words, the references in brackets are to uh, <coughs> to the to the wars. Okay, Rabbi, on the previous page with the map. Yeah. Could you tell us the significance of the arrows? That's the way the forces are moving. In other words, he moves from Ptolemaeus. Um, forces in Sepporis eventually go south to Jaffa. Um, there are th these represent the various attacks that occurred on the various cities over the course of sixty-seven. So you can see, um, and, and and in Josephus, the, this is where. Um, you'll see a lot of the mentions. And, of course, the stars are where there are significant accounts of the sea. There are sieges, significant sieges of these major centers. Um, and uh, this is where, when you read the account of this campaign, where a lot of the description is um, done. And we're, we're going to take a look at that So um, uh, in a minute. Um, so if you can continue down the chronology... Titus then now marches from Alexandria, which means he would be coming up the coast uh, from the delta, across the Gaza Strip, up through what we would call Ashkelon, and so on and so forth. And he joined, and he all the way up the Weimaris to Ptolemaeus, um, and joins the 15th Legion with his father's 5th and 10th Legion. Um, and this is where we learn all of it. And so there are 60 thousand Roman troops involved in this campaign. And do we feel that that is a, a real number? Yes, that's a real number. And then local kings, including a Herod Agrippa I, furnish uh, another, you know, 10,000, close. it looks like 10,000 men of various forces. So we're talking an army of about 70,000 men of regular legionnaires, auxiliaries, um, allies, cavalry. Uh, I mean, this is a, by standards of the day, is a very large army. Okay? It's not, it's not an insignificant force. Wouldn't be an insignificant force today. Okay? So, um, Placidus, who was the, um, the commander in Sephorus, uh, tries to attack Jopata, Joapata, which is the one of the centers of Josephus's uh, command, and uh, fails. 
Okay? So, um, what happens is, is that um, now Vespasian moves. So, May, it's May 67 before the main action occurs. All right? So, this is like six months after the Battle of Beth Haron. So, um, do we have any idea of this, the number of the, the rebels? Not well, Josephus will give accounts of various numbers, but he, I can't say with any accuracy that we do. Um, and, and again, when he talks about the number of people who were killed, my gut feeling is, is that these are huge numbers. I mean, they may be correct, but um, that the problem often. You see, when Josephus talks about when we know the actual numbers of the legions, we have a very accurate description of how many men. Because we know how many men are in the legions uh, and so on. When we're talking some of these other numbers, they could be exaggerated. Uh, numbers in these ancient texts usually are. Do we know how many troops Josephus had himself? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We will, we'll, we'll take a look. Um, So, Josephus retreats to Tiberias, which is one of the important centers in the area, and he writes to Jerusalem for instructions. And this is actually worth looking at, because it sort of begins to show how he's not so... Um, I mean, you know, again, we talked about it last time. He is, I think he's trying to... In his account in the war, he's trying to show the val valor of the Jews, but the f but the foolishness mm -hmm. and the and what he considers to be the incredible treachery of the leaders of the rebellion. Um, but he obviously wants to show himself in a good light, and and I think he's on the one hand he wants to show the valor of the Jews, on the other hand the foolishness of the revolt, and he wants to see himself um, as both a great military leader but also someone who was actually against the rebellion in the first place. Um, and, you know, there he has to f deal from the, it's obvious from the autobiography, he has to deal with the charge of him being a traitor for the rest of his life. Yes, Robert. He writes to Jerusalem for instruction. Yeah. We have a very good idea from what you're telling us what was going on on the Roman side. Yeah. But I don't have a feel what's going on on the Jewish rebel side. At the moment, you have a government that is a coalition of various forces, the more moderates and the more radicals. That will change. And it's headed primarily by the high priest. He is Jonathan? sort of... No, Ananias. Ananias, the high priest. Um, okay, so let's take a look at what this passage uh, referring to his... Um, his uh, going talking to um, Jerusalem, um, and and this is on page seven hundred and seventy four, uh, the third uh, book of the wars, chapter seven, paragraph two, line one hundred and thirty five. That's uh, book. Th sorry, did I say book two? Book three, chapter book three, chapter seven. Uh, paragraph two. It's book three. 774? 774. Okay. Um, now, who got appointed Josephus as the command? He was appointed by the count, the provisional government in Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, that, that, like, the latter part of book two talks about his appointment um, uh, after, in other words, after the defeat of Cestius, uh, the rest of book two talks about the organization of the rebels, the sending of Josephus to Galilee, his dealing with the opposition with that, um, and, uh, and, and that's kind of where you end at the end of book two. Book three is about, okay, now Nero is, you know, what's, what's going on, and so on and so forth. So even though he really wasn't, you know, wholeheartedly into a revolt, he's appointed um, commander of the... Yeah, exactly. There's a certain amount also of who uh, the various uh, uh, more radical commanders, and um, there's also discussion of... Um, riots against Jews in other parts of the East. Um, and um, interestingly enough, in uh, chapter 3 of, um, of, of book 3, there's a description, a geographical description of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. These are uh, th these kinds of uh, uh, asides 
uh, are not unusual in Josephus, where it, it because you know, and and part of the historical uh, sort of the way historians wrote, they will they will give an, a, a a geographical and even what we would call you know telling you about the biology and the the fauna and the flora, and and eventually you will see there's a there's a long description of the Roman army that comes in, and then there's even a longer description of Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, before the siege starts. So he does these little interruptions, these sidelines, to give you a sort of full picture of what's going on. So uh, if you're interested in his discussion of, you know, the, uh, of the geographic uh, discussion of these things, that's chapter 3 of book uh, 3. So, um, okay, so let's, let's start. Irma, do you want to start on um, page 774? Again, num uh, it's book 3, chapter 7. Um, paragraph 2, line 135. As to Josephus, his retiring into that city, which he chose as the most fit for his security, put it into great fear. For the people of Tiberias did not imagine that he would have run away unless he had entirely despaired of the success of the war. And indeed, as to that point, they were not mistaken about his opinion. For he saw whether the affairs of the Jews would end at last, and was sensible that they had, they had but one way of escaping, and that was by repentance. Notice that according to Josephus, he always talking himself in the third person here, yeah. this was the, when he saw the army of Vespasian and was yeah. forced to retreat mm -hmm. in the Galilee. He's got these fortified locations, but he cannot face the army in a direct battle. It's too big. It's too powerful. He's retreated all the way across the Galilee uh, from the border near Ptolemaeus, I would assume, <laughs> all the way to Tiberias on the lake of um, uh, the, the Sea of Galilee. And, um, and the point is, he's now realized this is a big mistake. <laughs> okay, go on. However, although he expected that the Romans would forgive him, yet did he choose to die many times over rather than to betray his country and to dishonor that supreme command of the army which had been entrusted with him, or to live happily under those against whom he was sent to fight. And these kind of noble sentiments would appeal to the Romans, yeah. you know, who, who would read this, right? Yeah. He's, he knows it's a mistake, but he's, you know, he has to support his country and support the, the oath, so to speak, of his command. Yes, oh, Jackie. I, I think it's interesting that he puts this thought in, in the third person. He, it's, he, like, it's like, not only just these things, but it's saying, like, I'm being very uh, objective yeah. about this thing, you know. I, this is how it was laid out, you know. But does this remind you of anybody in American history? Oh, there's some guy you call a traitor. Um, Lee, General Lee, in the um, in the Civil War, he had been. Oh, yeah, West Point. Well, he went to West Point. He was a commander of West Point. He was in the uh, Union yeah. Army. He was a commander in, at West Point. Mm -hmm. He was a guy who actually put down John Brown's uh, attack on Harper's Ferry. Mm -hmm. um, he was fairly high up in the ranks of the Federal Army, and he was at. He would have been asked by Lincoln to become the commander. He was wasn't he? He was asked. He was. He was. He was asked. He turned it down, and he felt the necessity, despite his mm -hmm. oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, mm -hmm. yeah. he felt that his commitment to his people, his state of Virginia, was a higher thing. Okay, mm -hmm. that the honorable thing to do was to go and try and defend Virginia, even though he obviously felt that it, what was going on was wrong. I mean, I, I, maybe. I don't know him well enough to say that. But he's an honorable man in a dishonorable cause. <laughs> okay? I mean, and in a certain sense, that's what Josephus is saying. He's trying to be an honorable man in a dishonorable and foolish cause. Read on. He determined, therefore. He determined, therefore, to give an exact account of affairs to the principal men at Jerusalem by a letter that he might not, by too much aggrandizing the power of the enemy, make them too timorous, nor by relating that their power beneath the truth might encourage them to stand out when they were perhaps disposed to repent. So he was trying to give an objective account of the number. I mean, people knew the Romans were coming. Maybe they didn't realize 
how big the response would have been. Okay? He also sent them word that if they thought of coming to terms, they must suddenly write him an answer. Or if they resolve upon war, they must send him an army sufficient to fight the Romans. Accordingly, he wrote these things and sent messengers immediately to carry his letter to Jerusalem. Okay, so the point is, he realizes he doesn't have the forces to stand up to Vespasian. All right? So the first thing that, if you uh, look back you should, you know, at the map, from the Ptolemaeus, Vespasian goes and attacks uh, Gabara. Um, that's what, um, what happens. Um, and he, um, he kills all the men. This is very typical of Romans putting down a rebellion. And all the towns in the neighborhood are burnt to the ground. And anybody who survives becomes slaves. This was part of the way, uh, part of the booty that, Roman, uh, that the Romans got out of campaigns was they sold, the, sold people into slavery and they got a lot of money for it. So that was, that's kind of an advantage to, but they usually did not put the men into slavery. They usually killed them. Okay. So now we're um, in June. And here is where Vespasian, as you'll see in the map, goes from Gabara to Jatapata. Okay. So this we'll take a look at. Um, and this is... Um, if we take a look uh, a little bit further to number three, so why don't we pick it up uh, there? Cal, do you want to pick it up? We're just continuing on from where Irma stopped. Uh, it's, again, it's cha it's book three, chapter seven, now paragraph three, line one uh, forty one, page seven seventy four. Now Vespasian was very desirous of demolishing Jotapata, for he had gotten intelligence. That the greatest part of the army had retired. The thither, enemy. Of the enemy, I'm sorry, had retired thither, and that it was on the uh, on other accounts a place of great security to them. Accordingly, he sent both footmen and horsemen to level the road, which was mountainous and rocky, not without difficulty to be traveled over by footmen, but absolutely impracticable for horsemen. Notice, so he has engineers to uh, make the road better in front of him uh, with cavalry to protect the engineers. I mean, the Romans were incredible engineers. What is J uh, that town now? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I forget. I mean, I think it's, I, you know, I can't remember offhand. Well, I'll, I'll check it out. I'm not sure it actually is a town. I mean, it may just be a ruin at the moment. Yeah, be destroyed. yeah. Well, go yeah, on. No, but I meant, you know, uh, yeah, go on. Now these workmen accomplished what they were about in four days' time, and opened a broad way to the army. On the fifth day, which was the 21st of the month Artemisius, which is E.R., Josephus prevented him, and came from Tiberias, and went into Jotapata, and raised the drooping spirits of the Jews. And a certain deserter told him this good news to Vespasian, that Josephus had removed himself thither, which made him make haste to the city, as supposing that, with taking that, he should take all Judea, in case he could but withal get Josephus under his power. So he took this news to be of the vastest advantage to him, and believed it to be brought about by the providence of God, that he who appeared to be the most prudent man of all their enemies, had of his own accord shut himself up in a place of sure custody. Accordingly, he sent Placidus with a thousand horsemen, and Ebutius a decurion, person that was of eminency both in counsel and in action to encompass the city round that Josephus might not escape away privately. Vespasian also the very next day took his whole army and followed them and by marching till late in the evening arrived then at Jotapata and bringing his army to the northern side of the city he pitched his camp on a certain small hill which was seven furlongs from the city and still greatly endeavored to be well seen by the enemy to put them into a consternation, which was indeed so terrible to the Jews immediately that no one of them durst go out beyond the wall. Yet did the Romans put off the attack at that time, because they had marched all the day, although they placed a double row of battalions round the city with a third row beyond them, round the whole, 
which considered of cavalry, in order to stop up every way for an exit, which thing making the Jews despair of escaping, excited them to act more boldly, for nothing makes men fight so desperately in war as mm -hmm. necessity. Interestingly enough, so typically uh, the Romans make sure that they've surrounded the city so that nobody can escape. Um, which Josephus says causes both fear as well as determination because the, the, the defenders know there's no escape. And if there's no escape, they might as well, they know they're going to die. So they might as well, what? Cornered rat. A cornered rat. Yes, oh. a cornered rat. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Cal, sounds like your voice is a little off today. Uh, yes. <laughs> like frogs croak. <laughs> Well, all right. We'll have we'll have, let's uh, let's just pass this down a bit, and we'll have uh, Robert uh, carry on. No, number five. Now, when an assault was made the next day by the Romans, the Jews that first stayed out of the walls and opposed them, and met them as having been formed themselves in a camp before the city walls. But when Vespasian had set against them the archers and slingers and the whole multitude that could throw to a great distance, he permitted them to go to work, while he himself, with the footmen, got upon it. Accli acclivity, mm -hmm. whatever that means, whence the city might easily be taken. Josephus was then in fear for the city and leaped out, and all the Jewish multitude with him there fell together amongst the Romans in great numbers and drove them away wow. from the wall and performed a great many glo <laughs> glorious and bold actions. <laughs> great many glorious and bold actions. Yet did they suffer as much as they made the enemy suffer. For as a despair of deliverance encouraged the Jews, so did a sense of shame equally encourage the Romans. Mm. These last had skill as well as strength, for the other had only courage, which armed them and made them fight furious. Notice that what he's saying is, is that the Romans were better trained and better armed. And the only thing the Jews had was, you know, <laughs> determination and courage. So yeah, the, the, this, this psychological explanation of the, the fighters is fascinating. Yes, isn't it? Yeah, you don't usually get that in a battle. I mean, he's describing how everybody Remi feels. It reminds one of the well, Warsaw Ghetto. It, the, the, what it says to me is, uh, this, is this is opinion, you know. Oh, sure. Uh, because that's how he's seeing <laughs> it. How there. true that was. But, you know, but, but, but they but, did manage to. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, but Irv, but Irv is pointing out something that was extremely important in these fights, and that was, um, despite everything, the discipline, the training, um, the, the morale was essential to these things, mm -hmm. okay? Because it's not something where you could stand at a distance. I mean, once you got in hand-to-hand, -hand, right, once the slingers and the who throw rocks and the, the, the archers and the people throwing long javelins, once you get in there into a, a melee, um, you know, you, it's, despite everything, you're literally, see, you know, fighting your enemy hand-to-hand, -hand, and it's stabbing and being stabbed, right, and crushed. It's, it's not... Uh, Hand-to-hand -hand combat is it requires extreme amount of, uh, uh, of something to get you to do that. Um, and by the way, you know, I just heard something or read something, and I don't remember the exact reference, that historians, military historians have gone over accounts of battles and found, uh, like I think they were looking at ancient Greek sources, have found that, in fact, the notion of PTSD was well known in ancient sources, that the impact of bloody combat had a tremendous impact on people who'd been through it. And there's enough to, in ancient sources to suggest this. So, um, uh, you know, even a veteran soldier um, who had been in battle before is, is going to it's not an easy thing to do to grapple with somebody in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Despite, I mean, that's where the training and the discipline takes over. But if you're losing, you know, and you're fighting a determined enemy, it can be really uh, difficult. Yeah, Jackie. Yeah, well, I was going to say, you brought up the Civil War before, and I've always thought about um, the battles of the Civil War, which were very bloody, and so many people were lost, and these guys just kept coming at each other um, you know, even though they knew, you know, how many had been killed and they were all over the field, and the next day they'd get up and do it again. But they did suffer what we would call PTSD. In other words, yeah. people, oh, yeah. who, no, I'm, people I'm, who deserted, people who refused to go back to fight. I mean, the moralization 
um, could cripple an army despite their numbers and despite their training and equipment. Yeah, yeah Robert. This reminds me very much of the attitude of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That the, the Romans were complete. the Romans, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the Germans were completely mm -hmm. taken aback by how long it took them to subdue the, the ghetto, although right. they had nothing with which to fight. Exactly. But they were going to die anyway. Right. So read on, finish the paragraph. They had wounded a great many of the Romans. Uh, what oh. line is it? Last oh, uh, let's start 154. And when the fight had lasted all day, it was put to an end by the coming on of night. They had wounded a great many of the Romans, and killed of them thirteen men of the Jews' side, seventeen were slain. That's all? Oh, and six hundred, that's all? Yeah. And the next day the Jews made it another... six hundred wounded. Yeah. Yeah. All right, paragraph six, go on. On the next day the Jews made another attack upon the Romans, and went out of the walls and fought a much more desperate battle with them, than before, for they were now become more courageous than formerly, and that on account of the unexpected good opposition which they had made the day before, as they found the Romans also to fight more desperately, for a sense of shame inflamed those into a passion as esteemed their failure of a sudden victory to be a kind of defeat. In other words, the Roman legions had such a sense of superiority and inevitability that when they didn't perform well, they were ashamed. This is not something unusual, by the way, to have happened in other mm -hmm. engagements. And that would, they felt the honor of their legions had been besmirched by them not winning, and they would therefore fight more furiously the next day. This, again, is something you see in military units where there is a great sense of uh, the notion of honor uh, towards the unit, towards the... The, the legion, the, you know, which is why the standards and the eagles become mm -hmm. so holy. And this, of course, is exactly the kind of thing that was cultivated in later military history in various kinds of regimental formations um, in the Napoleonic Wars, in the Civil War, even in the mod in <coughs> modern conflict, right? Would it be uh, in pride? Yes, pride in the previous achievements, the battle honors of a unit. That's, that's absolutely true, Paul. I mean, look at the, uh, when, you, when, you, when you look, for example, in the modern American army and you look at some of the particularly famous units like the 82nd Airborne, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they, what do they call themselves? The Screaming Eagles, I guess. Uh, and, and, and their battle honors from the Second World War, right? Um, and how that, that uh, informs the modern uh, members of that unit. Uh, and the same thing in the British Army, for example, the Grenadier Guards, the, uh, the Coldstream Guards, the various uh, units that have incredible famous battle honors from the Napoleonic Wars, having fought at Waterloo and all these kinds of things. This is something that, and you can imagine the legions themselves having this history, which they did, um, to, you know, the, the honor of the legion is at stake here. Read on. Thus, did. Thus did the Romans try to make an impression upon the Jews till the fifth day continually, while the people of Jodapata made sallies out and fought at the walls most desperately. Nor were the Jews affrighted at the strength of the enemy, nor were the Romans discouraged at the difficulty they met in taking the city. So this is a, this is a, a fairly a significant <coughs> series of fight that goes on. And again, in a siege... Um, you know, the defenders are always at a slight advantage uh, in a siege. It reduces the effectiveness of the... But the, what's interesting is how much the, the, the Jewish forces march out of the walls to fight rather than just stay inside and wait for them to be attacked. This might be a strategic mistake. Um, all right? Um, Jackie, do you want to pick it up at uh, uh, paragraph 7, line 158? Now, Joseph Joe Jonah Pata is almost all of it built upon a precipice, having on all of the other sides of it, in every way, valleys immensely deep and steep, insomuch that those who would look down would have to their sight fail them before it reaches to the bottom. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is only to be come at on the north side, where the utmost part of the city is built on the mountain. As it ends obliquely at, at a plain, this mountain Josephus had encompassed with a wall when he fortified the city, that its top might not be capable of being seized upon by the enemies. The city is covered all around by, with other mountains and can no 
way be seen till a man comes just upon it. And this was the strong situation at Joe Tapak. Uh, what I'll do is when I record, when I uh, do this, uh, make the recording of this, I will try and find some pictures of the of the area so you can see what it uh, looks like. Uh, maybe you should pass the recording a little bit. All right, so paragraph 8, 161, Jack, you keep going, Vespasian. Vespasian, therefore, in order to try how he might overcome the natural strength of the place, as well as the bold defense of the Jews, made a resolution to prosecute the siege with vigor. And to that end, he called upon the commanders that were under him to a council of war, and consulted with them which way the assault might be managed to the best advantage. And when the resolution was there met, taken to raise a bank against that part of the wall which was practical, he sent his whole army abroad to get the materials together. So notice this, you see this, this goes through a very typical kind of siege. First there are some immediate assaults to try and take the city uh, when they first arrive, essentially, right? They get their army together, there are assaults on the city. When these fail, it's now going to settle down to a siege. And this was this is very typical of any, I mean, up until, you know, for centuries and centuries, up until the 20th century, this is uh, maybe the Civil War, but the point is, no, including the Civil War, you try to assault a place first, and if that fails, you settle into a re regular siege. So what is going to happen is the Romans now are going to build a wooden wall all around the city by cutting down the trees in the area. They did this later in Jerusalem as well, which, by the way, this is one of the ways in which war is ecologically disastrous and can have an impact for centuries afterwards. Um, the, in fact, the forests around Jerusalem, and I'll repeat this again when we get to the siege, by being cut down by the Romans were not restored until the Zionist move, uh, movement in the 20th century. So for almost 2,000 years, the hills around Jerusalem had been denuded of trees because of the siege of the Romans. Would you like to know where Jodapada is today? Yes, it, where is it? Yodfat is the name. Yodfat, it. okay. It's a that's, Moshav. It's a Moshav? In the lower Galilee, south of Carmel. Yeah, that makes sense, where it is. And it's, uh, then they say, fans of Roman history should not miss visiting Yodfat, where Josephus, general and chronicler of the great revolt of the Jews, etc. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll try to find pictures if there are any ruins there and we'll be able to see it. And, and the topography. The topography, yeah. yes. I think that's they're very interesting. Okay, so read on, Jackie. So okay. when they had cut... So when they had cut down all the trees on the mountains and that adjoined to the city and had gotten together a vast heap of stones beside the wood they had cut down, some of them bought hurt, brought hurdles in order to avoid the effects of the darts that were shot from above them. In other words, they would erect these kind of uh, shields, large wooden uh, things, to stop uh, being shot at. Go on. These hurdles they spread over the banks, under cover where for, of they formed their bank, and so were little or nothing hurt by the darts that were thrown upon them from the wall while others pulled the neighboring hillocks to pieces and perpetually brought earth to them, so that while they were busy three sorts of ways, nobody was idle. However, the Jews cast great stones from the walls upon the hurdles which protected the men, with all sorts of darts also, and the noise of what could not reach them was yet so terrible that it was some impediment to the work. Now this is before, of course, artillery from... Uh, uh, which meant they could get much closer, but they want to get close enough, but they don't want to get too close. And, of course, by erecting these shields, these wooden shields, uh, that reflects it. Now, later on, when, you know, uh, uh, cannons are invented, um, they do exactly the same mm -hmm. things. They build these things that are okay. meant to absorb the cannon fire from mm -hmm. the walls of the defenders so that it won't affect the trenches, because what they do is they dig a series of trenches getting closer and closer to the walls, and then they establish a battery so they can get close enough to knock the walls down. There's all science of siege warfare, and you see the elements of what later becomes much more systematic, but the Romans knew all about this. This is a very typical systematic siege that is going on. Okay, uh, all right, so now we're on paragraph 9, line 166. <coughs> Uh, let us move on. Okay, me. Your turn. Sure. 
Vespasian, <laughs> <laughs> Vespasian then set the engines for throwing stones and darts round about the city. The number of the engines was in all 160 and bade them fall to work and dislodge those that were upon the wall. At the same time, such engines as were intended for that purpose threw at once lances upon them with great noise, and the stones of the weight of a talent were thrown by the engines that were prepared for that purpose. Together with fire and a vast multitude of arrows which made the wall so dangerous that the Jews durst not only not to come upon it, but durst not to come to those parts within the walls which were reached by the engines. For the multitude of the Arabian archers, as well also as all those that threw darts and slung stones, fell to work at the same time with the engines. You should every time it says darts, you should say ja, you should say javelins. That gives you a better idea. Darts, we think of like little darts. No, we're talking javelins yeah. here. But again, so now he's got a wall to protect his uh, engines, and notice it says 160. That is very typical, given his. Uh, apparently, 55 catapults to a legion were quite normal. So he has three legions. He's got, you know, 160 catapults. And these are, of course, things that are going to throw rocks, which are going to try and knock down the walls, but primarily meant to kill, stop anybody from actually manning the walls. And if you throw fire to start a fire in the city and arrows to kill the defenders, you're making it impossible for them to defend on the walls. So the the numbers really were standards. Yes. It, it was a formula. Absolutely. That they worked by. Exactly. They were extremely well organized. There were a certain number of, of, of men in the legion uh, supported by a certain number of cavalry were supported. Each one carried it. I mean, legions were incredibly self-sufficient. They had men who were engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every time they stopped after a day's march, they built a fortified camp. You know, that was an absolute essential for them to build a fortified camp um, when they stopped for the night. So a legionnaire was not just a fighter, but was a workman, a, you know, a, an engineer. I mean, they, they, they had a, that's why they were, that's why they won. <laughs> okay. Well, they had huge numbers. They were able to do it. But it's not only the, it's not the sheer numbers. It's the organization and the training that was really what made the, the Roman legions for hundreds of years unstoppable. Uh, if they had good commanders, if you had a bad commander, you know, you could be a disaster, like what happened, as I mentioned last time, in the Teutonburg Forest in, in Germany uh, during the time of Augustus. You could have a bad command, Or what, what happened with Cestius Gallus, who had a perfectly, you know, he had all the catapults mm -hmm. and whatever, and he just was a, he, it was a terrible <laughs> blunder on his part. Okay, read on. Phyllis. Yet did not the others lie still when they could not throw at the Romans from a, from a higher place? For they made sallies out of the city like private robbers by parties and pulled away the hurdles that covered the workmen and killed them when they were thus naked. And when those workmen gave way, these cast away the earth that composed the bank and burnt the wooden parts of it together with the hurdles, till at length Vespasian perceived that the intervals were there between the works were of disadvantage to him, for those spaces of ground afforded the Jews a place for assaulting the Romans. So he united the hurdles, and at the same time joined one part of the army to the other, which prevented the private excursions of the Jews. Okay, and where it says, um, you know, uh, robbers, uh, it's translated in this translation in guerrilla fashion. Yeah. Okay, so what is the idea? That there is not a complete circle yet of these things, and wherever there are gaps, the Jews are going to run out, attack the engineers, try and destroy the, 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 the fortifications and the catapults. Mm -hmm. And so Vespasian, realizing that um, this is impeding it, he completes the circle, encirclement of the city. Okay. Um, Ellie, do you want to pick it up? Paragraph uh, 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 10, line 171. And when the bank... 
And when the bank is now raised and brought nearer than ever to the battlements that belonged to the walls, Josephus thought it would be entirely wrong in him if he could not make any contrivances in opposition to theirs, and that might be for the city's preservation. So he got together his workmen and ordered them to build the wall higher. And when they said that this was impossible to be done while so many darts were thrown at them, he invented this sort of cover for them. He bade them fix piles and expand before them raw hides of oxen newly killed, that these hides, by yielding and hollowing themselves where the stones were thrown at them, might receive them, for that the other darts would slide off them and the fire that was thrown would be quenched by the moisture that was in them, and these he set before the workmen. And under them these workmen went, to, went on with their works in safety, and raised the wall higher, and that both by day and by night, till it was twenty cubits high. He also built a good number of towers upon the wall, and fitted it to strong battlements. This greatly discouraged the Romans, who in their own opinions were, ha were already gotten within the walls, while they were at once, they were now at once astonished at Josephus's contrivance and at the fortitude of the citizens that were in the city. So he's trying, he's protecting his own workmen to raise the height of the walls and so on and so forth. So um, what happens now is that um, uh, Vespasian decides to um, basically uh, at this point, um, stops the attacks and tries to starve the people into surrender. This is this is what happens in the, um, the the next paragraph, because he doesn't want to demoralize his troops with futile attacks or cause them to be killed, um, so he decides to starve them out. In paragraph 12, um, line 181, it talks about how they had plenty of uh, food. But there was, uh, there was a problem with water because they got most of their water from uh, rainwater. So um, what happens is in, in, in then Vespasian hopes that that will event, eventually you know, um, you know, get them out. Um, and there were various other stratagems that, that go on. Uh, if you look in now paragraph uh, 15 on page 777, line 193, it talks about he doesn't believe, Josephus now believes that, in effect, um, he, the, the city is going to be lost. And um, what happens uh, afterwards is um, uh, he, he's trying, he tries to buck up the, the people, but what, you, um, what, what comes on after this um, is the, um, the series, it's sort of, you know, back and forth and back and forth until it's, um, you know, we can, we can read through this. I mean, this, it's a, because Josephus is the commander and he's the center of attention, you, you can see he's describing every little bit of the siege, and it, it goes on and on and on, and this, of course, is where um, Josephus discusses the issue of, you know, eventually of, you know, the people who want to kill themselves and, and so on and so forth. We don't, we don't have to read the, the, the whole of it, um, but the, the point is, um, it, 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 if this starts at the beginning of June, um, by the beginning of July they breach the walls but are not able to, um, to get in. Um, and if you go back to the chronology, um, in the middle of July, um, uh, uh, Titus and Trajan, who is the uh, commander of the 10th Legion and the father of the future Emperor Trajan, um, they attack uh, another uh, local uh, uh, town, and according to Josephus, they slaughter 15,000 people and take 2,100 captive. Again, that's an enormous number. Um, there's also apparently, for some reason, uh, the Samaritans were... Uh, contemplating revolt, and so um, the, uh, the 5th Legion commander is sent to attack the Samaritans and they kill 11,600 people. And then we go back to the siege, uh, and um, what happens is that in the end of July, Titus and some of the men of the 15th Legion mount the walls before dawn, kill the sentries, the citadel is taken, um, and they pour into the city, and according to Josephus, 40,000 people are killed. 
and 1,200 women and infants are captured. That follows then Josephus hiding in a cave with other citizens, um, and he tries to, you know, this is the whole thing about where he tries to, um, you know, the men kill themselves, Josephus doesn't, and um, this is where he surrenders to the Romans, and uh, uh, in the end of July predicts that Rome, you know, Vespasian will become emperor, and Vespasian um, keeps him as a prisoner. So, um, what happens then after, so uh, Jodapata is, is, uh, is captured, and uh, at the end of July, Vespasian goes back to Ptolemaeus and then goes to Caesarea, um, but he leaves the 5th and the 10th uh, legion there, and um, the, uh, the 15th uh, is sent to uh, uh, Scythopopolis, which is one of the cities on the eastern side of the, you know, a part of the Decapolis, um, and therefore east of the, uh, of the Sea of Galilee. I'm on page 5. Um, apparently, there are some Jewish uh, pirates in Jaffa, <laughs> and uh, he gets rid of those. Um, and uh, what happens is, according to Josephus, the news of the fall of Jodapata reaches Jerusalem, and they think Josephus is dead, and they mourn him for 30 days, and then when they find out he's alive, they're really pissed off, <laughs> okay? And they want to seek revenge because they, uh, you know, he should have killed himself, and so uh, uh, it, it's quite interesting. Okay, so now we go to August. He's uh, Rabbi, rest Rabbi could, is, is there anywhere that we could look at how Josephus, his actual words for uh, his justification... Oh, we, we looked at that uh, earlier. In other words, he... he 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 does just and that that that's when he kind of justifies the fact you know God is against you know one of his things where he says God so is that's against us. Yeah, on exactly. One. If you if you go to uh, to okay. chapter eight, I can go back to um, it, it talks about how he's discovered and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so now we're so now we're in August of sixty seven, and um, he um, Vespasian leaves Caesarea. He goes to. Agrippa's, uh, Herod Agrippa's kingdom at Caesarea Philippi and uh, rests there for 20 days. I mean, you have to understand, this is all very physically telling on the, on the troops. They have to rest, they're wounded, and so on and so forth. Um, and he, um, uh, they, they, they then go to, t the next big attack is on Tiberius um, and, um, uh, and where they're tricked by one of the rebel leaders um, uh, and later on, the, uh, the elders and respected citizens, again, Tiberius, not everybody wants to be part of the revolt, and they flee to Agrippa, um, and as a favor to Agrippa, uh, Vespasian negotiates a uh, surrender, but the rebel commander, uh, after agreeing to surrender, flee um, instead, and um, nonetheless, uh, Tiberius is taken with no violence or uh, a pillage, and if you go, you know, back to the map, you see. Then he attacks a place called uh, uh, Tan uh, Kea, um, and um, uh, so there's a discussion of the siege there. Um, this is in chapter uh, ten, um, and Titus is is sort of one of the basically the main commander of this. Um, the rebels flee to uh, the Sea of Galilee in boats. Um, but uh, Vespasian attacks them, uh, gathers boats, and there's a battle on the lake itself where the rebels are slaughtered. That uh, area, that Scythopolis area, yeah. that's now, I believe, Bethshan. Yes. And um, that, so the, the fantastic ruins there have... I would think, you know, some kind of relationship. But that's late. So, those are those are late, uh, 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 later built on. later on. Yeah, this yeah. is before those those yeah. things are built. Beitshan was an important center. Uh, it actually started as a garrison city uh, for the Egyptians way way back. Yeah, that's where my daughter lived for thirteen. Years. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm familiar. All right. With Beitshan. So by September of sixty-seven, if you're following the chronology, most of the Galilee had um, surrendered. What you have left is. Uh, several uh, uh, sort of fortress okay, areas, page, page six, six. Paragraph two. yeah, it, it says the remainings are Gamala, Mount Tabor, and Giscala. Mm -hmm. 
and and that's where um, that's where he's going to talk about. Uh, uh, you know, he's going to put a lot about the, the siege of Gamala. Uh, and that's where uh, Agrippa actually tries to uh, parlay, but he, but they throw, but they attack him and he's hit and wounded by a stone. So, um, uh, and, and also at this point, Titus has been sent to meet with the governor of, um, of Syria who replaced Cestius. Um, and Gamala is a very costly siege for the Romans. Uh, talks about how they try to knock down their walls with the rams, and 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 how there are Romans killed in the cities. Um, and then in uh, Book Four, um, uh, we may want to take a look at this. This is quite interesting. Uh, if you go to Book Four, Chapter One, um, Vespasian apparently has to encourage his troops. Um, so this is book four, chapter one, paragraph six, which is found on uh, page 798 and is line 39. So 798. And uh, Paul, when you get it, you'll start reading it. What happens is we have here um, a little bit of a speech uh, by Vespasian. Now, you notice all the detail uh, that Josephus has given uh to the siege of Jotapata because he was there, and the details on the Roman side he would have gotten from Vespasian's own um, uh, chronicles, uh, written chronicles of the siege. So he actually, having been there as a witness, but also having access to the other side, could give us both sides of the siege in great detail. So we, I'm assuming that it's pretty accurate uh, because of his sources. And, you know, by now he's sort of uh, being schlepped around as a prisoner by Vespasian. So um, what follows the speech of Vespasian, uh, Josephus could have very well heard this speech, right? Um, so, Paul, you want to pick it up, paragraph 6, where it says, And, and now Vespasian. And now Vespasian comforted his army, which was much de 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 dejected. De dejected by reflecting on their ill success because they had never before fallen into such a calamity. And besides uh, this. this, because they were generally ashamed, Wait. greatly ashamed that they had left their general alone in the great danger. As uh, as to what concerned himself, he avoided to say anything, and uh, and he that he uh, might uh, by no means seem to complain of it. Now, what they meant by the general was it, uh, up a little before that one of the centurions was apparently um, in, in, a found, uh, in a house with a, about 10 of his soldiers, and when the Romans retreated, he was left there, and he had to kind of sneak out. So Vespasian is kind of saying to them, hey, you left one of your commanders uh, behind. Okay, go on. But he said... But he said uh, that we, we ought to uh, uh, beat... Bear uh, manfully. Bear, bear manly, manfully... Uh, what usually uh, falls out in, out in the war, and and this by considering what the nature of the war is and how uh, it can never uh, be that we must conquer without bloodshed on our own side. For there, there stands about us that uh, fortune, uh, which is of its own nature uh, mutable. mutable. Let's stop there. Um, the Romans, by this point in their history, would have had a sense of invincibility about them, right? That we can never lose. Um, the British Navy, by the way, had the same attitude by the time of the beginning of the War of 1812. They had long been the most powerful navy in the world, 
and had defeated the French and the Spanish in victory after victory, the last, of course, big one having been Trafalgar in 1805. So when, in the early part of the War of 1812, the Americans, having built six heavy frigates, which includes the USS Constitution, which you've never seen in Boston, you should. Excuse me, Scott, yes? I've got to tell you, my father worked in the Boston Navy shipyard, yes. and he was part of the, as an electrician, he was part of the crew that electrified the Constitution to make the museum. Well, if you've never it's been there, <laughs> it's one of the few surviving early 19th century ships in the world, one of the others, of course, being the HMS Victory in England, and it's what was called a heavy frigate. It was uh, a frigate was, um, you know, the the top ships in the in the Brit in the navy were called the ships of the line, and a first class ship was a ship of at least 105 guns, and then your know, second class, third class frigates were technically, I think, fourth class ships, and um, they usually range from 28 to 36 guns. Well, the Americans built what we call heavy frigates, which were much bigger, with over about 44 guns of a particular a larger nature. And But being a frigate, they were quite fast because they realized they couldn't match the British Navy in ships of the line, the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. But these smaller ships could be used especially for raiding and attacking and so on. So uh, th I'm just telling you this because it's an interesting sort of comparison. So in the early part of the War of 1812, these heavy frigates, of which there were six that had been built, uh, um, there were a series of, ma of victories by these frigates over British frigates uh, that were of lesser power. But the British had such a sense of invincibility by that point that the commanders of these smaller frigates went against the American frigates like assuming they would win. Mm -hmm. And so the Constitution and a couple of the other American frigates you know, destroyed uh, probably, I think, three or four British frigates in ship-to-ship -ship actions. And it was appalling to the British. It was incredibly demoralizing to them because they had gotten to the point of assuming a state of invincibility. And they felt that they had been dishon dishonored by it. So what happens? Um, what happens is, is that um, the British then settle into a blockade of the major harbors, uh, New York and Boston especially, um, and 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 there there is a frigate that a British frigate that is uh, um, that is blockading Boston. There is one of the American frigates is in the harbor getting refitted, and the British commander realizes he's going to have to go back to Halifax to uh, resupply, and he sends a message into the American commander. I'm going to have to leave. Do you want to come out and fight it out? He it's a duel. And the British commander does this to, to, to bring back the honor of the British Navy. The American commander, whose name is Lawrence, says no. no, he says yes. He comes out, and it's a very, very famous engagement. And um, uh, that's where Lawrence, uh, Lawrence uh, gets mortally wounded in it. And I believe that's where he says, don't give up the ship, that very famous line that becomes encouraging to the American Navy after that. But what happens is, is that in a very short action lasting of only about a half an hour, uh, the British uh, basically, you know, almost virtually destroys the American um, uh, frigate and haul it back to <coughs> Halifax with the wounded, including uh, cap the captain of the American frigate who dies. He, his body is brought on shore with full military honors, and he is given great honor as a commander of great honor and buried in the military cemetery in Halifax. Mm -hmm. All right? And there's actually songs. There was a song that was sung, uh, created about it, a folk song about this battle. And so this is the same kind of attitude, right? Where you have this sense of invincibility, and yet you are defeated in an engagement, and, and Vespasian has to say to them, this is what happens in war. These are the fortunes of war. And, you know, you thought you were going to just come in and take these, un, you know, undisciplined Jews so easily. That's not war as done. And if you go a little further, um, he says, and it is the part of weak... Where, where are you I'm on line 42. And it as it is the part of weak people to be too much puffed up with good success, so it is the part of cowards to be too much affrighted at that which is ill. So he's giving this great sort of, you know, morale-boosting thing, okay? And it was not um, their, 
you know, uh, lack of strength. Here it's called effeminacy. I don't know what the actual term is. Um, nor the valor of the Jews. He says it's neither that. It's the difficulty of this place. Right? And um, he gives them sort of, you know, don't worry about this. And we can do this. You know, we're basically, you know, these people are barbarians. And, um, you know, he says in line 46, we ought therefore to return to our own virtue and to be rather angry than any longer dejected at this unlucky misfortune and let everyone seek for his own consolation from his own hand. And he says, you know, I'm going to go in and we're going to we're going to take this place. This is a real, you know, uh, pep rally here. Um, and, and so what happens is they renew the siege and they... Um, um, they, uh, they eventually take the city. Um, and I just want to finish up, um, as uh, go back to our uh, chronology here. Um, he sends one of, again, Placidus, one of his, obviously, his main officers, to so take page seven. the bottom of page six, bottom top six. page seven. They attack Mount Tabor. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Mount Tabor. There was, of course, a famous battle there um, with uh, Deborah in the valley. Mount Tabor <coughs> is a, a mountain that can be, there's a road up the top, there's an area of village out it. It's very, it also has a place in Christian mm -hmm. uh, history. Uh, Tabor can is fair, steep, but it can be walked up. I mean, I've done it. Um, and uh, actually, I've walked down, not up. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, the, the point is, uh, it's a good place to fortify. It commands the whole Jezreel Valley. Um, and of course, in the story in the Bible, Deborah and Barak come down from the mountain and attack uh, the, uh, the uh, forces of... Um, what's his name, Sisera in the plain. Um, but what happens is, is that they take Mount Tabor. Uh, then in November, they take, uh, the, they finish the siege of Gamala and uh, many citizens commit suicide. Then he, the, the, the rest of it is, uh, he sends Titus to attack Giscala, which is the last of it. Um, the, um, the commander, John of Giscala, manages to escape um, uh, through a, so a subterfuge and, and, and runs to um, Jerusalem. In the process, Titus, taking the city, kills 6,000 people and captures 3,000 men and women, and that's the end of the siege. That's the end of the campaign in Galilee. Galilee, by, by, the, um, uh, by the middle of November of 67, the Galilee is subdued. And that ends the first part of Vespasian's uh, campaign. So... We will end it there, and so we will be eating next week, and we'll continue on with the next phase of the war.